Hello and welcome to Mr Gunn's recording of um, information that I hope is useful to you as we begin to think about how to pass an essay in utilitarianism. Using a fun, oh, bear with me, fun new program. Well these are some of the key scholars that we're getting to know now as we talk about utilitarianism starting with Bentham and ending in Singer. Um, all slightly very, uh, different styles, we're going to cover them in this PowerPoint. And at this point you should know that if it, when preparing for the utilitarianism essay, what you need are the following bits of information. You should break your revision up into these areas. You need, excuse me, you need... Background information, you will need key terminology, you will need strengths and weaknesses, you will need to evaluate. And when you evaluate, the key is to look at this bit here, evaluate, you have to value the argument, that is, give us an impression of whether you think the argument is good bad, strong, weak, useful, or useless. That's what makes it your personal valuation before concluding. If you had revised this topic, you could look at a slide like this, and you could start to mind map around uh, to see how well you know the topic. You might, for example, pick negative utilitarianism and say, well, I know that that is Karl Popper, who looks a bit like Bilbo, Bilbo Baggins, as we'll see later. You might explain that qualitative utilitarianism breaks pleasure into higher and lower, and you could mind map around this kind of slide or, or key terms to check what you know. We know that utilitarianism is a theory that is hedonistic, and here we have the School of Athens image of some hedonists. Um, we can see people um, partying, basically. We've got different activities going on all over the place, people that are slumped, people that are contemplating, arguing, looks very vibrant. Um, at these parties, I'm told people used to drink until they were sick in the middle and then continue um, to party. They would go on for a couple of days. And I think we can all agree that it's good that as a society that nobody does that anymore. As I've said, the theory stems from uh, hedonism. Hedonism is something that the ancient Greeks examined, whether a life full of pleasure-seeking is, is worthwhile. The key for utilitarianism as a conception is that it's about the ends and it's about aiming for pleasure and that there are differences between pleasure and happiness, although the difference is subtle. Here it says pleasure is not the same as happiness. Happiness is a result from the use of reason, which is why we associate happiness with John Stuart Mill and we associate pleasure with Bentham. Here he is, Jeremy Bentham. When you introduce Jeremy Bentham, you get uh, credit for knowing a bit about his context. So we might call Jeremy Bentham a legal philosopher who aimed for political reform. He made it so that the working class could send letters, for example. He um, had a background in studying economics. You have to forgive my writing, but just to let you know what sort of things we should be thinking about, and that his family uh, were lawyers as well. And that, but the key is that he aimed to reform the legal system to serve more people, ultimately. Bentham was a consequentialist. No action is wrong in itself. It's right or wrong based on the consequences it produces. Um, a moral act, moral, morality and ethics are based around whether or not we maximise pleasure or minimise pain. Um, and he gave us the utilitarian or hedonic calculus to calculate that. Here's a direct quote from Bentham. And we might... Um, consider that to be a formulation of the principle of utility. By adding up the amounts of pleasure and pain for each possible act, we should be able to calculate the good thing to do. 
happiness is pleasure minus pain, something that Bentham called the two sovereign masters. When you think about how to use the hedonic calculus in your essay, know that it should amount to at least one paragraph and that this is a key term and you should explain um, what it means by referring to the seven um, features of the hedonic calculus, but you don't need to explain all of them. What you might do instead is say there are seven um, different uh, considerations to make when you use the hedonic calculus, for example, and then you might talk about um, the duration of pleasure or the chance of succession of pleasures or the purity of pleasures, the chance of succession then being uh, repeti repeated is actually referred to by Bentham as fucsundity. And we have that elsewhere in our notes. Yes, this is Jeremy Bentham's real dead head that was not embalmed very successfully, so they replaced it with this waxy head. Um, I have to tell you, unfortunately, the rumours of them kicking it around uh, as a football were probably not true. That's the head I mean. What's key here is that the greatest good is the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So the priority for Bentham is to calculate um, how many people are affected, which means that we can wind up prioritising the majority over the minority, um, regardless of what action is being committed or acted upon. Actions are judged as a means to an end, and we have come to call this act utilitarianism, and we should not follow rules, which is the opposite of deontology, the opposite of a philosopher like, for example, Immanuel Kant. We start to think then, what would be the problem if everyone acted as a utilitarian all the time? If everybody just acts only to make themselves very happy, what sort of people do you think uh, we would be? And whether actually good results are always the most important thing, we might think for a discussion on the second question, of a nuclear bomb winning a war, for example. Um, the good result there is that the war ends, the bad result is the huge amount of deaths in the instance, and we wonder whether that action itself was permanently wrong. And some of the ideas about what would be the problems if everyone acted as a utilitarian all the time, um, people normally think of the idea that we might become just pleasure seekers or like animals if we are only after pleasure all the time. For example, what reason would we have to uh, work very hard or become intellectuals? When introducing John Stuart Mill as our next key scholar who is famous for rule utilitarianism, um, we know to think about his context as well, raised as a expected to be a Benthamite and carry on utilitarianism, but he had a nervous breakdown because of it. Sorry, that says Benthamite, not anything else. Um, he had a nervous breakdown because he was subject to such um, intensive education. And when after his nervous breakdown, he felt like he had learned more about different types of pleasures and that some had a higher quality and some had lower. And he accused Bentham of being. Um, the subject of just an elite education or upbringing, and as a result, not knowing enough about the negatives in the world to be able to comment. So if we are thinking about Mill, we might wonder, well, how do we know what is a higher quality of pleasure? Well, he would say that the higher faculties must be involved in order to be sure that it's a higher pleasure. So we might say that studying, for example, where's my pen gone? Is a higher pleasure, believe it or not, studying philosophy, because it involves the, or invokes the higher faculties, um, which would avoid the criticism of us being pleasure seekers if we were to be utilitarians. And one of the tests you can give to a pleasure to find out whether it's higher or lower is wonder whether an animal could enjoy it. So sex, drugs, rock and roll, sorry to say it, they are lower pleasures. 
um, overeating, being lazy, um, those sorts of pleasures that an animal can enjoy are considered lower, whereas a higher pleasure involves the intellect or involves the use of our reason, which is more available to humans than it is to animals, according to Mill. And you might criticise this view by saying that modern studies of animals shows that they're capable of more than previously thought, much more, but that's a, a, an interesting evaluation you can make at a later point, and you might want a specific example if you're going to do that. He says a person will always, and this is definitely something to evaluate in AO2, will a person always choose higher human pleasures? He says that they will, and if they do not, it's because they are not a competent judge. And a competent judge can has two things. They have full control of their higher faculties. So children are not competent judges, and perhaps people with dementia or illnesses may not be, um, or diseases, or things that are affecting their ability to reason. They also have to have knowledge of both. Um, so if you haven't experienced other types of pleasures, then you may not be a competent judge. Uh, but this sometimes seems to suggest that people need to experience even some of the things that traditionally we're told to avoid in order to be a competent judge. Mill basically states, ask yourself, he, he asks, wants us to ask ourselves, would you right now change to be the world's happiest pig or simplistic animal? Would you lose all of the things you can do in your life to be a totally satisfied animal? He argues that most of us would not want to do this um, for the full allowance of the beast pleasures. Some people may say that they will, and there's a reason to disagree. But he argues that we can tell our intuition can, tells us that we'd rather be Socrates, very clever, than a happy fool, and we would um, rather be an unhappy person than a happy pig. And if you're of a different opinion, it's because you only know your own side of the question or you're not a competent judge. The moral dilemmas that we have presented here, we've discussed in class, but they show that perhaps according to apt utilitarianism, you would allow certain things and uh, that may seem quite extraordinary. Um, but under all utilitarianism, you might start not to allow such things because of the quality of pleasure derived. If you derive uh, high quality pleasure from torturing somebody, then you don't really fit John Stuart Mill's rule utilitarianism. But he's also going to introduce some other ideas to the theory that will show us that under rule utilitarianism, you would not be allowed to take action in either of these instances. And this is because of an idea that I refer to as social utility which is reinforced by the principle of universalizability. Mill says in, well, that we're all invested in one another's happiness. Uh, it's good to the aggregate of all persons. And what he asks is that when we think about taking a moral decision, we should imagine that others could take the same action in a similar circumstance and imagine that that rule existed. And if that rule did exist, we can then say, OK, well, has that improved or, or has that increased or decreased the social utility? If we think about torture, for example, if every now and then the government took, uh, took one of us away to torture us for information that they felt was really important, we might in the first short term instance derive some form of pleasure but over the long term the rest of the citizens it, with their social utility all of our shared happiness would decrease we would become unhappy with the state of affairs as we worried about justice and that kind of thing and that's one of the key ideas for Mill is that justice is based on uh, social utility and therefore certain rules must be created that over time through tried and tested methods uh, raised social utilities. We couldn't torture somebody yeah, because it would decrease everybody's satisfaction, decrease everybody's security. Mill gets some criticism here because we might wonder, has he really explained why we can move uh, from one person to everybody? Um, and we wonder if this is a fallacy, which is a philosophical word of saying mistake. But there's a positive here, which is that it fits into most religious uh, teaching. It seems to fit quite nicely with uh, the golden rule uh, as found in Matthew. And 
if we think about that golden rule, it's actually present in many major world religions as the number one ethical rule, treat uh, people as you would like to be treated. Um, he doesn't really um, separate this idea of motive um, to a satisfactory degree. Some people would say that um, it can be a bit self-interested. In order to avoid any action being taken to produce desirable consequences that may over a long time produce low social utility, Mill introduces rules and as a result it gets called rule utilitarianism. And the main purpose of the rules is to establish social order and justice. Do make sure these appear in your essay. And the rules are those which, if followed universally, are most likely. So we're, we're suggesting over a longer term how we're trying to speculate over a longer term how we would raise social utility. And he says that the best way to do that is that the rules should be tried and tested. And over time, we can reflect on these ideas. So it's a contrast to act, but do know that Mill didn't ever use this word and Bentham didn't ever use this word. There we go then, key differences. Quantity and quality between these two. I suppose you could kind of tell the difference just by looking at these pictures really. Sorry, I should have, that should be drawn like that really, shouldn't it? Otherwise I'm comparing the thoughts of a waxy head with that of a great mind. We might think of um, Mill was writing a lot about liberty and freedom and female philosophers. They love John Stuart Mill because he did so much for, um, for women and the rights of women with his moral philosophy, the subject of women, is one of his major pieces of work. They quite like Bentham too. Bentham did write specifically that we should never use just he when we're writing when it could be he or she. Um, we shouldn't use gender-specific pronouns. He argued that case in the 1800s. People haven't really listened to that for Stephen Pinker, who um, alternates between he and she per chapter at random in his writing. You might be interested to know. I don't know, maybe not. Um, Bentham also wrote an article and got in trouble because he said that Jesus may have been gay. Whoa. If you are making an essay plan, if you're, if you're really into your revision, this is the sort of list you should be able to produce from memory because we've got several key features and we have the relationship between them. And what we, what we do when we make lists like this, and you could make a more complex one, is we're breaking an idea, like Bentham's idea, into its smaller parts, and that means we are analysing. When you break something down into smaller parts to get a broader understanding, you're analysing ideas. It's quite tricky and it's subtle just to explain what the main difference is. And I want you to focus on this idea that it's what the principle of utility is applied to. The principle of utility is the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But with that utilitarianism, it's the greatest happiness for the greatest number in every individual circumstance. So you might argue that it's extremely relative to the situation. But with all utilitarianism, we use the principle, the greatest happiness for the greatest number, to make a set of rules that we then have to follow in many situations, especially if you are a strong rule utilitarian. So that's the key difference. We refer to act utilitarianism as a teleological consequences uh, relativist theory. There are many weaknesses. This is the main one. Nice and easy one to use in your AO2, so make sure you do it. It's often really difficult to predict the consequences. Uh, any action itself. So there's a criticism in your textbook that says that the problem is that utilitarianism doesn't even go as far as to say something like rape in itself is wrong, or murder, or anything else that you can think of, genocide. Um, if it produces more happiness, then it's uh, perhaps a moral thing to do if the majority desire it, which, let's face it, we all have many problems with. Um, one is that we might want to be a bit more specific about what we mean by pleasure, that it rejects the defence for minorities. So what about our human rights? Surely Mill does a better job of protecting human rights. And 
this last one, you could say it's impractical to say that we should calculate the morality of each choice, but I think it's much more intelligent to pick a feature of the um, of the hedonic calculus specifically and to argue that that feature is perhaps not very useful or is difficult to use. Like you might, for example, say that you think how near you are, something Bentham calls propinquity, how near you are to a situation shouldn't matter. It doesn't matter to Peter Singer, for example, um, because he says, what morally relevant difference does it make how near we are to a situation? All utilitarianism you often see explained like this. I would say that rather than being strictly deontological, it has a deontological element with the uh, inclusion of rules. Here we have... Um, but if you imagine that you're following rule utilitarianism and you have the, the situation of torture and you think, well, should we torture this individual to find out where a bomb is located? Um, under rule utilitarianism, you can't because it will decrease the social utility over time. But what about if the public never found out? And many believe these are real situations. And Sidgwick wrote about this situation, for example. And he might say that there are certain people in power that can break the rules slightly. Now, it's important and useful in your essay to differentiate because you might say that it's a real advantage that some people can be weak rule utilitarians and suggest that although there should be some rules, in certain situations we can uh, disregard the rule if our reason dictates. And you might say that's a strength or a weakness. You might say that the theory has the... Weak rule utilitarians have resolved the issue of what to do in difficult circumstances. Or you might say that it has become far too subjective to be a weak rule utilitarian, but that strong rule utilitarians are much more objective. Um, and whenever we have the objective-subjective divide, it's a matter of opinion as to which one you prefer, and that your evaluation involves you explaining uh, why you favour one or the other. And rule utilitarianism suffers some similar weaknesses to... Uh, to act utilitarianism in terms of the definitions of pleasure and the ability to predict consequences. Um, what about it becoming slightly deontological and a bit more like Kant? Why not? Why, if we think if we want to be more like Kant, why don't we just follow Kantism, his theory? Does the fact that people get to choose whether they are rule followers or rule modifiers um, make a difference? If you're modifying the rule, aren't you basically just an act utilitarian, doing what you like? Henry Sidgwick has an extraordinary beard. I think of him as an original hipster, but his writing wasn't very pop philosophy-like. And Peter Singer says he's the most complex and best contributing utilitarian. And he says that, he agrees that pleasure over pain is the ultimate goal of an ethical decision. And he's a bit more like Bentham because he doesn't think it's possible to judge other people's pleasures. So we might say that it is judgment. Oh dear, this bit's gone a bit funny. Free. But he says that the process of deciding what to do is intuitive and self-evident. That makes him a foundationalist as he argues that Knowing what to do in a situation comes from a gut feeling or instinct, and that's the way it should remain. But that there's something moral about this idea of the principle of universalizability, because when we are making a decision, we're kind of, we, we tend to hold the belief that anyone else in a similar situation, if they were trying to be ethical, would do the same sort of thing. And as a result, trying to follow laws that are based around the idea of justice, fair treatment to any individual, um, is key for moral thinking for Sidgwick. G.E. Moore is the most philosopher-looking philosopher of all time. Look at him here in his armchair. He's posed for this picture, and he must have said, let me get my pipe. And G.E. Moore contributes as an intuitionist as well, like Sidgwick, an intuitionist utilitarian. And he proposed ideal utilitarianism in Principia Ethica 1903, a major piece of ethical works. And he argues that certain ideas have intrinsic disvalue and should be shunned, um, such as these knowing and enjoying admiration of, sorry, 
admiration of uh, evil or ugly things has intrinsic disvalue and should be shunned or prevented. Hastings Rashtal first introduced the idea of ideal utilitarianism um, to focus on being less hedonistic than previous utilitarians. Now we have Popper, who I'm convinced looks like Bilbo, Bilbo Baggins. He looks like he's about to say, give me the ring or precious. But top chap, Karl Popper, and he proposed negative utilitarianism, which is a bit more like Eastern in its ethical thoughts, a bit more like the teachings of uh, Buddhists. He basically suggests that um, we should focus on the utilitarian principle working the other way around. His negative utilitarian principle is that we should minimise suffering rather than maximise pleasure. And that, that was the mistake of Sidgwick, was not to realise that we should be specifically focusing on reducing, um, reducing suffering. If you imagine that, that we as a country spend money, why improve state of affairs for certain individuals when there are homeless, when there are disabled people who can't, don't have equal opportunities? And the argument can continue. Why not improve healthcare rather than improving entertainment? That type of thing. Here's a great quote, you don't need the whole thing. We should replace it by a more modest and realistic principle, the principle that the fight against avoidable misery should be recognised aim, while the increase of happiness should be left to the private initiative. I, I love this quote because it's so interesting to wonder. Public policy, should public policy be what ethics is about? Creating public po policy that reduces misery, while happiness is up to the individual. This would have been better. Up to one person alone. Ultimately, in the open society and its enemies, he argues that there's a fundamental mistake of utilitarianism, which is that ethics should be about uh, answering the call of human suffering and not increasing the happiness of individuals when they're perhaps fine anyway. If you're lacking suffering, it doesn't mean you're full of happiness. Happiness will be up to you. His main point is that those that try to raise the state of affairs and increase happiness for everybody, they fail. If you promise us paradise, then you will give us a hell. Um, and he levels this accusation at communist and, and fascist dictatorships that didn't work, trying to make the, the whole population experience happiness and live to the best ideals, uh, really failed. And he says, well, that shows that what we should be working on is decreasing the worst things in society and, in, and leaving the increasing of the best, of feeling great, laughing, being happy and entertained to individuals to sort out for themselves. Next, we are thinking about the preference utilitarians, such as Peter Singer, who is a very influential Australian, R.M. Hare, who has no hair. Um, Brandt, who has a funky design on this book cover. And note that two out of three preference utilitarians hold their head during pictures. A preference utilitarian tries to ask, what, um, to what degree can a being have interests or preferences? If the a being has preferences or interests, then they must all be taken into consideration, not just the degree to which they feel happy. There's, people are more complex than that. So as a result, we take into account all of people's in, interests, the interest in justice for others, the interest to have a secure place to live, to educate ourselves for free rights, that kind of thing, all count as much as our desire for happiness. Hare says, for example, that all, uh, any being that has the capability to have a preference counts equally. And this is why uh, this has links to the Gates Foundation, because the Gates Foundation has that slogan that sounds as utilitarian as this. Hare wants us to stand in someone else's shoes when we answer a moral dilemma. If we wonder, should I take, when you're arguing with somebody or you disagree, um, you wonder, what should I do? Step out the situation. Imagine you're an impartial spectator, which is a key term, by the way, impartial spectator, in order to make decisions that, decisions that are universalizable. Or as John Rawls calls it, that's Rawls, R-A-W-L-S, he says we should legislate or make moral rules 
from an original position. That's in Theory of Justice 1971. And that's similar, and I'm adding this, sorry, that says position. I'm adding it to this as extra scholarly input. Singer says that um, we can't count our own preferences more, as more important than uh, anybody else. He doesn't really take into account um, uh, locality. He thinks that as a world community, we should be reducing the amount of suffering around the world. Well, you guys know from his effective altruism TED Talk, uh, and we watched everyone's preferences or interests are weighed equally. Brandt's preference utilitarianism says that if we went through a process of cognitive psychotherapy and we explored the reasons for our viewpoints and we focused on our true values, then we would all accept a form of utilitarianism. So he's saying that if we are psychologically in, sound, in a sound position, we would all become uh, less biased, less partial, and much more uh, utilitarian uh, it would be a form of utilitarianism for everybody if we removed psychological blocks. So you psychologists perhaps might want to use Brandt in your essays. Okay, a time to reflect about the strengths and weaknesses of utilitarianism. And don't forget that you must be practicing your AO2 skills and get key scholars from outside the area. So look up the view particularly of Kant, why he would disagree with utilitarianism. Um, look up Rosenstant and, and any others that you find in the textbook as well. Here's a general um, list of the strengths and the weaknesses. You can, of course, pause this video if you want to use these. I'm trying to get to the end of this quite quickly because it's getting a bit too long. Some more weaknesses. These are to help you think originally for yourself because we know that what they're actually lacking, all of these are lacking your view, they're lacking the question wording, which you must use. We don't yet know the question. You must directly answer the question. It must be a brand new, fresh, original essay. We are missing these things, and we are also missing key scholars. And if you can tick these three ideas whilst talking about the weaknesses, you'll be writing a decent essay. Here's an example of a conclusion, but it doesn't relate directly to question wording. And it's only one sentence long, but it's the sort of sentence you might use to, to begin to think about your own conclusions. OK, and then at the end, could you identify the key scholars from here? Um, could you talk about their main points of view? If you can start to map from this kind of document, then you're doing really well. And I hope that you found that essay useful. Please give me some feedback as you start to use these resources. I'm sure we can make them a bit better. And good luck with your revision.